Thank you everyone for joining us on this morning. I know there was some distracting, but maybe um, exciting news, at least for the environment um, this morning, among other things. So um, thank you everyone for tuning in. My name is Eleanor Hines. I'm the North Sound Baykeeper Lead Scientist here at Resources. Um, and um, today we're at the eighth annual Cherry Point Science Forum. And so um, usually we've, this is the first time we've done this online um, and hopefully this will be the last time we do it online, but who knows um, next year what we'll hold. Um, so thank you for tuning in. Um, there will be a recording available after this. If you um, don't get to catch it all or you wanna share it with your friends, um, we'll send that to you afterwards. Um, Rondi will also, she's our Aquatic Reserves um, AmeriCorps um, for this uh, year. And so she'll follow up with an email that has a survey um, to see how we can better serve you with events like this in the future. So it's really important for you guys to take that. Um, we also will include um, additional resources in um, that email as well as the recording. Um, and so um, I would like to start off with a land acknowledgement, um, taking a moment to acknowledge that we are on the ancestral homelands of the Coast Salish people. Uh, we support tribal treaty rights and are grateful for the tribe's enduring care of the lands and waters we all rely on. Um, Cherry Point, in particular, is located on the usual and accustomed areas of several federally recognized tribes, including Lummi, Nooksack, Swinomish, Suquamish, and Tulalip tribes. So wherever you happen to be today, um, I ask you to take a moment um, and take some time to acknowledge the ancestral homelands that you are on. And if you don't know, um, I'd like to challenge you to uh, do a little bit of digging and find out some more um, information. So um, this photo here is actually taken at Cherry Point. Um, and it is um, suspected that it might possibly be a reef net anchoring site or maybe a fish trap that was um, made long ago by Coast Salish peoples in the area. And Rondi or anyone, if I'm showing the wrong screen, let me know, because sometimes that happens. Um, so I also want to go over a little bit of Zoom etiquette before we get in. Um, as we talked about in our um, pre-forum conversation a little bit, I think everyone's feeling a little Zoomed out. So I would also add in with Zoom etiquette, if you need to get up and, you know, get another cup of coffee, you need to stretch, um, you know, take a bio break, whatever you need, please do that at any time. Um, but we do have a scheduled break. Um, around 11 o'clock. So um, hopefully uh, folks will <laughs> not get to have too much um, screen time and get have your, your brain able to engage a little bit better. Um, so this event is being recorded. Um, we do ask that you please mute yourself and turn off your cameras. Um, the presenters will have those on, of course. And then um, we'll each, after each presenter, we'll have time for questions and answers. So um, there's two ways that you can ask questions. One is you can enter at any point in time, um, you can enter into the chat box. So if you hover your mouse over the bottom of the screen, you should see a little um, chat thing. So you click on that and then you get this chat box over here and you can type to everyone. Um, if you have technical questions, you can feel free to type those specifically to Rondi. Um, her name, I think right now might be resources. So you can type that to her. She's also the co-host. Um, <clears throat> if you would like to raise your hand, you can also do that. Um, the way to do that will be to hover again um, at the bottom of your screen, and then you can click on participants. And then you can, um, in the participants box, you'll see a little raise hand function. So you can just click on that. If you happen to be joining us by phone, um, to toggle back and forth between mute and unmute, you'll hit the star six button. If you'd like to raise your hand, you would then hit the star nine button um, and then we can call on you. Um, so you might be wondering what, <laughs> what's our agenda today? So um, we're starting off with the introduction right now. Um, when I wrap up the introduction, I'll um, show you guys a quick Cherry Point Aquatic Reserve video. Um, and then we will um, move into 
our exciting presenters. Um, so Dr. Rachel Arnold from Northwest Indian College will present on hooligans of the Nooksack River, um, followed by a question and answer session. Um, depending on time, we will um, take a five to 10 minute or so bio break or stretch break, you know, get the blood flowing, um, and then we'll come back. And um, Dr. John Bauer with Western Washington University will present on the role of marine birds in the Cherry Point food web. Um, followed again with a question and answer, and we will wrap everything up by 1230 so you can continue to enjoy your weekend and maybe the sun will be out, which would be nice. Um, so Cherry Point Aquatic Reserve, I don't know how many folks on this call or in this meeting have been there before, but um, it's a really special place. So if you have been there, I would love for you to type into the chat box, what are some of your favorite things about Cherry Point? What, uh, for me, I really love um, going there at low tide. There's always cool, fun, and interesting and new things to find out there. Um, and um, <laughs> yes, somebody just mentioned that they miss cookies, coffee, and chats. We all do. I'm so sorry that we have not figured out how to share cookies and coffee and tea over Zoom meetings um, with you all like we would in person. Um, so please um, take breaks as you need to. All right. Um, so if you haven't been to Cherry Point before, or maybe you've been there and it's been a while, you're not quite sure where it is, on the um, left-hand side, there's a map of Washington State, and Cherry Point is in Whatcom County, um, which is in red there. And then um, over to the right-hand side is a little bit more zoomed-in map, and so you can see that there's um, Bellingham down in the right-hand corner, and if you go up by five and then hang a left around Ferndale and just head straight out to the water, you'll eventually run into the Cherry Point Aquatic Reserve. And then um, if you um, aren't exactly aware of like where the site boundaries are for the Cherry Point Aquatic Reserve, here is a um, map. Um, giving a little bit more detail. So at the north end, you can see that um, the aquatic reserve starts around Point Whitehorn, just south of Birch Bay State Park. And then it wraps around and goes all the way down to about Neptune Beach. Um, you, so the um, Cherry Point Aquatic Reserve is um, in the pink sort of hash marks on this map. And then you might also notice that there's some bird icons on there. And so those bird icons are actually the locations where um, we have ongoing seabird monitoring with the Cherry Point Aquatic Reserve Citizen Stewardship Committee. And so um, the Cherry Point Aquatic Reserve, <laughs> what is it? You might be wondering, you might've heard of it. You might not be fully aware of it. I'm gonna give you a very, very brief overview, um, but I hope that this maybe gives you enough information that you're curious about learning more if you don't know. Um, already. So they are aquatic state-owned lands that are managed by the Washington State Department of Natural Resources. It was the, the Cherry Point Aquatic Reserve was established in 2010 and there are five main goals of the management plan. And so I also on a side note want to mention that the management plan as we speak is actually going through its 10-year update. Um, but the five year, or sorry, the five goals um, currently are identify, protect, restore, and enhance functions and nat natural processes, <clears throat> improve and protect water quality, protect and help recover indicator fish and wildlife species and habitats, facilitate stewardship and habitats and er, <laughs> facilitate stewardship of habitats and species, and identify, respect, and protect archeological, cultural, and historical resources within the reserve. And so we got this amazing aquatic reserve. We got this amazing management plan. And then um, it was recognized that maybe there was another piece uh, missing. And so um, then the Cherry Point Aquatic Reserve Citizen Stewardship Committee was formed because we wanted to make sure that um, there were stakeholders and sort of like local boots on the ground in the mud out there working to um, really fulfill this management plan and making sure that the community had involvement and, and that stakeholders were involved. And so, 
Um, some of the stuff that they do really revolves around education and outreach events, such as this one here that you guys are at today. Um, they also uh, host an annual event called What's the Point, usually at Point Whitehorn Park. We were unable to host that last June, um, but we're hoping this year that we can maybe <clears throat> reimagine what that event looks like, um, maybe with some virtual tours and some um, awesome videos and other stuff like that. This last year, um, one of our um, Citizen Stewardship Committee members did get out there with um, some lead naturalists and they um, took some awesome videos that you can check out on Facebook. And we'll send links to that in the follow-up email if anyone's interested in checking those out. Um, it'll take you right back to the beach. It's kind of it's kind of neat. Um, they also um, do technical document review and comments on things like um, the management plan update that's ongoing right now, um, <clears throat> as well as the shoreline master plan update that is also going on right now, um, and other things too, to make sure that um, those things stay consistent with the management plan um, for Cherry Point. Um, they also do a whole bunch of community science monitoring. Um, and so um, some of those include marine birds, intertidal species, and sea star wasting syndrome. And so um, I think I failed to explain earlier in case you didn't know, um, resources provides staff support for the um, Cherry Point Aquatic Reserve Citizen Stewardship Committee um, so that they can, you know, be their best selves and accomplish all of this with a little bit of staff support. Because sometimes um, it's difficult for volunteers to really um, do everything without somebody doing kind of the boring administrative side of stuff. And um, Rondi Nordahl is our current Aquatic Reserves AmeriCorps um, who is really um, helping out with them right now. So um, <clears throat> if you're interested in getting involved, um, there's a couple things that you can do. Um, one thing that you can definitely do is just get out to the Cherry Point Aquatic Reserve and enjoy it um, with proper beach etiquette, making sure that you know, you're know you not loving Cherry Point to death. Sometimes on those really low tide days, um, it can be <laughs> um, challenging because everyone's really excited to see all the intertidal organisms and they pick them up and move them around. And then by the end, um, some of the critters are looking pretty sad. Um, so if you do get out there, please, you know, make sure that you're, uh, practicing proper beach etiquette, leave it, you know, the way that you found it. Um, <clears throat> the Cherry Point Aquatic Reserve Citizen Search Committees also have monthly meetings from 3 to 5 p.m. the first Wednesday, or Wednesday of each month. So we just had our, uh, monthly meeting earlier this week and, um, we'll have one, I think it's December... Second will be the next one. And um, when we are allowed to meet in person, um, those meetings have traditionally been hosted at resources um, located in Bellingham, but um, right now they're happening by Zoom. Um, and then another thing that you can also do is um, email with Rondi, her email's right there, but um, she'll also be emailing out to you after this event. Um, and you can ask her for more information or, you know, ask her questions about how to more specifically get involved, whether it's, you know, participating in an upcoming meeting, um, some kind of community science monitoring or other vol volunteering opportunities with the committee. Um, I also encourage you all to check out aquaticreserves.org for more information. There's um, lots and lots of stuff there, um, including the management plan, but um, there's also things like a map that shows you where some of the public access points are too. So if you're not sure where those are, um, that might, map might help you out a little bit on that website. And so with that, I am going to get the, um, the video going. Um, And so I need to stop share and then reshare. Sorry about that, folks. <clears throat> All right.
you're looking out of here at the Cherry Point Aquatic Reserve, this area is a fabulous place for finding a lot of different kinds of seashore life. This is one of the most diverse areas that I've seen in all of the Georgia Strait. We need to educate the people to do their part in preserving an area like this, which is still relatively pristine. It's a low tide day, so we have an opportunity to bring out educated people who can tell us what do we see there in the tide pools, and we're sharing that with the community. Is it a crab? It is a kind of a crab. Yeah. We're counting birds, we're counting the intertidal species, counting starfish. It's a long-term monitoring project, so we're not seeing those tiny little changes. We're seeing what changes over 10 years so that we can figure out better ways to manage the aquatic reserve in the long run. Some of the important things that folks can do to protect this area, one, get out here and see what it's all about. It's hard to protect something when you don't know what it is have good beach etiquette, so making sure you don't love all the critters to death in the low tide. Check out aquaticreserves.org, learn about Cherry Point and all the other aquatic reserves, where they are, how to access them, and you can also find out when and where the citizen stewardship committees are meeting and get involved. And you can also find that um, on YouTube as well if you want to um, see it in the future. And we're a little bit ahead on time, so I wanted to pause in case anyone had any questions. Um, otherwise, we can uh, cue Rachel up to get her presentation started. Um, so I'm not seeing any hands raised, and I'm not seeing anything in the chat box. Rachel, are you ready to go? Oh, sorry. <laughs> we got an introduction to Rachel first, sorry. <laughs> um, so one of the Cherry Point Aquatic Reserve Citizen Stewardship Committee members, um, Robert K, um, who <clears throat> is labeled Deborah K, his wife, <laughs> who are both on the Cherry Point Aquatic Reserve Citizen Stewardship Committee. And so he is going to introduce Rachel for you guys. Hey everybody. Um, thanks so much for showing up this morning. We really appreciate it and um, that was just a fabulous introduction uh, that Eleanor gave. So just, uh, I'm gonna go right into our speaker because she pretty much said everything there is to say about uh, that. So it's my joy and my privilege to introduce Dr. Rachel, Ar Rachel Arnold of the Northwest Indian College. Thanks so much for willing willing to, do, to appear today and uh, share with us uh, all the good work you're doing. The title of her talk is The Hooligans of the Nooksack River Population Structure and Biology of the Hooligans, which I'm not going to even try for the scientific name, of the Nooksack River. And um, Dr. Arnold is the Associate Director of the Salish Sea Research Center at Northwest Indian College. She oversees a variety of genomic research programs, including population dynamics of the longfin smelt and community dynamics of, here we go, micro you you cario, cariotes. You can tell I'm a scientist, man. Sorry. Anyway, in Bellingham Bay, and uh, she also teaches genetics and evolution at the college and engages students in a variety of culturally related genomics projects. And we are absolutely thrilled to have her. Thanks so much. Here she is. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, this actually is my first Zoom uh, presentation, so. Here goes. Uh, can every, well, let's see. Let's 
go to presenter mode. Okay, can everybody hear me and see my screen? We can hear you and we can see your screen and we can see all of your slides. Like it's not in presenter mode if that's what you intended. Uh, it's, okay, hmm. I did put it in presenter mode, so let's... Um, sometimes if you stop share and then reshare, it sometimes fixes it. Okay. And then sometimes if you share the like actual, um, not like your desktop or the window, you share the actual like program that helps sometimes. Okay. Share screen. Okay, now presenter mode. Did that change this time? No, it did not. Hmm. It, okay, at the bottom of your screen, bit, but if at the bottom of your screen you can see the little slide icon. Bottom. No, for me, for me, it went into presenter mode, so I can't see anything except my first slide. Oh. Let's see if there's a way to. If well, if we can't get it worked out in the next few minutes, um, we can still see your slides. You just just know that um, we're seeing like your one. Oh, that worked. Whatever. You okay, did. it had like I I've, I've had this issue pop up from other presenters. I think it's when you have multiple monitors. Um, <laughs> so, okay. Um, okay, first slide, everybody can see that now. It's in presenter mode. Yes. Okay. So, all right. So thank you so much, everybody, for being here today. Um, uh, as already mentioned, I wanted to talk about the hooligans or the longfin smelt of the Nooksack River. And while this isn't specifically targeted toward uh, Cherry Point, obviously Cherry Point Point is within the Salish Sea, and uh, the longfin smelt uh, are an important part of the Salish Sea. And how much they're utilizing Cherry Point is at this point unknown. It could be quite a lot, um, as it is a very um, important part of of the Salish Sea. So without further ado, uh, Tiokawe is the Lummi name for the longfin smelt, and they are also called the hooligans. Their scientific name is Sprinkus thaliichthys, and I'll talk a little bit more about their, um, the, the, the name issue in a couple of slides. Um, so yeah, I am at the Salish Sea Research Center. I'm the associate director there. I run um, the genomics project. So we do work on forage fishes and uh, um, harmful algae uh, blooms in the Salish Sea. Okay, so I don't really have to do a lot to set the scene here. It's November. The winds have started picking up here in the Pacific Northwest. There's some large uh, rainfall. Uh, the temperature is dropping. The uh, sun is, is going away. It's dark, it's dreary, it's getting cold. And while at most times uh, or most other species will um, spawn or have their um, babies in springtime, this terrible time of the year is exactly when the hooligans decide it is time to spawn. So this is uh, the flooding rivers and the rains are an indication for the, the hooligans to start their migration upstream here in the Nooksack River. This is what a hooligan looks like or a longfin smelt. This is a, actually a male um, and uh, they will start running right around the middle of November. Typically Veterans Day is, is our time when we start looking um, for them to return. And to get back at what I mentioned about their name, um, so Tiokawe is the Lummi name. 
Longfin smelt is the common name for which they are known in the rest of the world outside of Bellingham. And inside of Bellingham here, they are locally known as the hooligan. And I wanted to take a second and mention that um, in the rest, when you're talking about people that are from elsewhere, uh, if, you, if they know what the hooligan is as a fish, um, they're probably thinking of a different species whose scientific name is Thaliacthes pacificus. So that hooligan or ooligan, as it is sometimes called, has the uh, common name of candlefish and eulicon as well. Um, and also they are known as the salvation uh, fish to a lot of the tribes in the Pacific Northwest. And this is because they, they run in the springtime, not the fall. And so in the springtime, this is a time when, you know, the food stores of of the winters are dwindling. And this is one of the first uh, fish to return to the rivers um, and hence the name salvation uh, fish. So they're very oily. Both the, both the longfin smelt and the ulicon are quite oily to the point where you can dry them out and light them and use them as candles, hence the that name candlefish. Um, and uh, the ulicon have a much higher population size. So uh, that's why most people, when you say hooligan, think of uh, the Ulicon. Um, and uh, they had these uh, things called the grease trails where they would take the oil from the Ulicon in the, uh, with the tribes of the Pacific Northwest and trade them to tribes uh, more inland. So those grease trails were from the oil that was used. Um, as far as the longfin smelt is concerned, uh, they do not render, we have no um, stories of them render, rendering down for their oil. Typically they're just eaten fresh, um, fried up in a pan uh, whole. So um, just, to, just to be aware that if you say hooligan elsewhere, uh, they might be thinking of a different species. Uh, like the Ulicon though, the uh, longfin smelt has a fairly large geographic uh, distribution. So they occur from Alaska all the way down to California. Uh, their southern range in the Bay Delta region of California is, is one of the most um, studied populations. And that's because they are being extirpated from that region, um, otherwise known as being uh, going extinct in that local region. And this is largely, they think, due to agricultural needs using the fresh water from the, the systems down there and not enough fresh water reaching um, to, to the mouth of the rivers. And then, uh, as you can see, there are some known populations in uh, Northern California, Oregon, on the coast of Washington, British Columbia, and all the way up to Alaska. And many of these populations, there's very little known about them and we just know they're there from records in the past. Um, the populations in Washington, there's a population in Lake Washington and this population is quite different in that it is landlocked. So it does not ever have a, uh, a time in the saltwater. Um, and there's actually a couple of lakes up in British Columbia as well that are uh, freshwater landlocked populations. Um, and then the populations in British Columbia and Alaska, again, just not a lot is known about these populations, either their uh, genetics or even their basic biological history. So what we do know, again, comes a lot from the biology, comes a lot from the Bay Delta region, where there's been a lot of research uh, put toward this, this species. So. Down there, they uh, are the eggs are laid in the freshwater to estuarine environments between January and April, and then they hatch uh, sometime between February and May. There are juveniles in the estuary between June and October, uh, subadults in November and April, and then they actually have two. They've de they've determined there's two uh, groups. One uh, that stays in the estuary and matures to adults, and then another group that will uh, migrate to the ocean and return to uh, the rivers as adults sometime between December and May and have their eggs, lay their eggs. So this is a, 
a beautiful drawing done by uh, Thane Yazi of the Salish Sea Research Center. Um, it's an indigenous uh, creation of, of depiction of the longfin smelt and then their um, like cartoon style of it. And this is what the fish actually look like. So the top individual is a male and the bottom individual is a female. And the males, uh, you can see, this is not really drawn to scale, but the males are larger, typically larger than the females. They're a little bit more gold color on top. And this bottom fin, this anal fin here is much larger in the males than it is in the females. And the females are more silvery. They're, um, they look a little bit more round because they're in the river because they're carrying all of those eggs upstream. Um, and then they have uh, lots of these little sticky eggs um, inside. So we know that they are laying them somewhere along the gravel or along debris in the, in the river. And interestingly, um, you know, from traditional ecological knowledge, we knew that they came in waves. So if you're out there fishing for them, um, you'll typically get a night of almost all males and then the next night it may be almost all female. So they're coming up in waves in this river system. And this is how we fish for them. So um, typically they're coming in at, in the middle of the night um, when the incoming tide is coming up or is pushing the river back. And uh, again, they come in the waves. So we'll usually get all males or all females. Uh, they are traditionally fished with dip nets and so that you can see on the left, um, this is a metal mesh uh, dip net. It's in the form of a cone. That's our own dip net actually. And usually they're more cylindrical, um, but we can actually put a camera inside the, the cone one at the, at the base to, to try to get some video footage. Um, but the Nooksack is incredibly turbulent and it's, uh, it's really difficult to get any video footage since um, it's hard to see. And then um, on the right here, this is Jeff Solomon. He is my right-hand man at Lummi Natural Resources and a Lummi Enrolled Tribal member. Um, he's demonstrating how you can put the dip net in the water and actually listen to the, at, at the base to hear the fish kind of like ping the mesh basket to know that there's actually a fish in there. And you can actually feel them a little bit too, especially if there's a, a more than one that you can feel them on that metal handle hitting the basket. Uh, so when I first started at Northwest Indian College, I was a faculty member and my uh, uh, duties were primarily to teach. Um, and now I've, I've graduated into the associate director position where um, my main duty is to uh, conduct research that is beneficial for the tribes and the peoples of this area. And I first learned about the hooligan from a colleague who told me that, you know, in just watch in November along Marine Drive, all of a sudden, all of these cars and trucks will just suddenly start showing up and park near the bridge or in the uh, parking lots there. And he said they were after some little little fish down there and he didn't know what it was. So the first year uh, in 2016, I went down there and figured out, um, you know, this is Sprinkus thaliichthys and uh, um, it's a very uh, culturally important species uh, to the Lummi people. So on one side of the river, you have uh, mostly uh, Lummi enrolled uh, tribal members fishing for the hooligan. And on the other side, you have a diverse group of people, um, a lot of uh, immigrants from Philippines and uh, Russia, actually. And then um, a lot of just uh, Caucasians from Bellingham who have lived here all of their lives. And this is what they've always done. So it's, it's so interesting to go down there and hear the diverse uh, stories about how they learned how to fish uh, for the hooligan. So on the left is a photograph of the mouth of the Nooksack River. This is, uh, leads out into Bellingham Bay as, as most of us are probably aware, um, but it, it didn't always uh, flow out to Bellingham Bay. In fact, uh, it flowed out to Lummi Bay until 1877 when a natural log jam was removed. 
So back then there was a lot of logging going on and people needed to get the logs down the river and out to Bellingham Bay for shipment or processing. And uh, <clears throat> they uh, decided to blow up this natural log jam near Ferndale and divert the river to, Lummi, uh, to Bellingham Bay instead of Lummi, Lummi Bay. And my first thought back then was, when I learned about this was, wow, that must have really changed things for anadromous fish that need to find this river and go upstream to spawn. Because if you know the, the area, the, the Lummi Peninsula is between Lummi Bay and Bellingham Bay, and it's not a small peninsula. Um, so my first question was, did that have some kind of effect on the population? Did it cause the populations to crash that um, needed to go up the Nooksack River? And thinking about it more now, uh, fishes really do have a great sense of olfactory uh, like smell in the water. And, um, and just by the fact that they're still here means at least some of them made it to the, to the Nooksack River via Bellingham Bay. And so I haven't fully like flushed this question out, but I kind of feel like now it probably wasn't as big of a deal as I originally thought it was. But it is kind of an interesting historical piece of information to note. And on that line, I just, this is actually a slide from my genetics and evolution course and why genetic diversity is so important because a lot of people don't understand why we are looking at genes um, instead of the number of individuals that are still out there in the environment. And so genetic diversity is really about um, a, a few things, but one of them is local adaptation. So the, the population in the Nooksack River may be better adapted locally to this specific area than other populations of the longfin smelt. And just having genetic diversity allows a species to change, uh, sorry, to adapt to a changing environment. So um, with climate change and the changing oceans, uh, they have to have that genetic diversity in order to adapt. Uh, some people wrongly assume that, you know, you have a change in the environment, a predator, and uh, the other species, the prey will um, evolve to, to deal with that predator. But if they don't have the genetic diversity to allow that evolution, that natural selection to act upon already within their, um, their, their genes, they're not going to adapt. They're going to go uh, extinct under high pressure. And it's also recognized by the IUCN as one of the three forms of biodiversity that we really need to look at uh, for conservation. So the IUCN is something that uh, you may have heard with the, the red list of which fish species to eat and which not. They do a lot of international conservation uh, studies. <clears throat> So the little graph down here um, just depicts what you may see versus what reflects reality. So the blue line can be like population size. It can be a large population that has a pretty good amount of genetic variation. And then if a population crashes, which you know potentially could have happened here with the, the log jam removal, then you have very few individuals and very low genetic variation. But then that population can rebound numbers why numbers wise far more quickly than the what the time it would take to regain the genetic diversity that has been lost. So genetic diversity occurs through mutation and gene flow, and that takes a lot of time. So even though you may see a population that seems large in size, that doesn't mean that they have the genetic diversity to adapt in a changing environment. And so that's something we're really concerned about with um, climate change and ocean acidification here in the Salish Sea. This is just a technical slide of how exactly uh, we do the sequencing at Northwest Indian College. Uh, so we have a state-of-the-art genomics laboratory um, and we're able to do this next generation sequencing and bioinformatic analyses. Uh, for these populations. And I won't get into that, but we'll say that if that's something that interests you, I'd be happy to talk to you about the methods. This is just a very quick um, 
uh, actually, let's go back to one here. So speaking of ge genetic diversity, uh, the Nooksack River uh, longfin smelt have uh, two, we, potentially two populations. There's an even year and an odd year. And they are thought to be two years old when re they return. But again, this is based on a lot of um, armchair biology, which is, you know, educated guesses. Uh, so if they're two years old, though, and they're always two years old when they return, that would mean that the odd, odd years are never mixing with the even years. And looking at the traditional ecological knowledge of the Lummi people, we know that the even years are stronger uh, have a stronger run than the odd years. And this was reflected in the time that we have been down at the, the years that we've been down at the river as well. So the first question I had was, are the, the even and odd years genetically similar or are they distinct? Do they need to be treated as separate populations or as one population? Uh, so <clears throat> this is a, just a, a quick answer. Um, so using those uh, genetic markers uh, along the bottom here, you can see uh, the 2016 year run and the 2017 year run and these ugly uh, green and red uh, colors here show the gen genetic diversity of the individuals. So the individuals are the vertical lines. And in the 2016 years, you can see if we assume that there's two populations or, or two types, then uh, each individual is mostly green with a little bit of red. And when you compare it to the 2017 year individuals, they again are mostly green and a little bit of red. And this is just a fancy way of showing that uh, they're really not genetically different. There's no structure between the even years and the odd years. And this cross validation error also shows us that the lowest number is our best number. And it can be assumed that this is actually a single population and not two populations. And so that brings us back to, you know, what do we know, what do we really know about the biology of the longfin smelt? And we assume that they are about two years old, but, you know, the newest research coming out of, of California, where they are doing a lot of that research is showing us that, in fact, um, there may be some three-year-olds that are returning, but there actually appear to be a number of one-year-olds returning to their, their river systems. And it actually doesn't take much gene flow between the two years to keep them genetically similar to each other. So um, I think our results are in line with the, what we best know about their biology. And so at the Salish Sea Research Center, we're continuing our work. We received another grant um, that we call the T Center for Community Marine Research. We are still working hand in hand with Lummi Natural Resources. Um, they are on the right picture here using our uh, research vessel at the Salish Sea Research Center to uh, actually gather um, sea cucumbers that day. Um, but we're continuing our work with the longfin smelt, trying to get at this question of learning more about their basic biology, uh, exactly where are they spawning um, and, <clears throat> and how far up the river are they spawning. Um, we have evidence that they used to go as far as uh, Ferndale and now it appears that they are only spawning within the, the very lower areas of the Nooksack River right around Marine Drive bridge. And so the big question as to why that has changed. And in addition, why that actually is um, correlated with uh, the, the um, populations in California, because they are also seeing this similar move of the, the longfin smelt there to spawn more closer to the mouth of the river and sometimes um, in the estuary itself and not in the fresh water now. And I, I guess, I mean, it's kind of the, the thing that comes to mind quickly, I think, is, is the agricultural issues with taking too much fresh water for them to be able to spawn in these environments. So going along with our future research, we have um, uh, collaborations with uh, people at, in other uh, institutions with uh, UC Davis and uh, Alaska as well 
to look at the populations there and to fit our, our Nooksack River individuals in this uh, larger analysis. Um, so this here, they are not in this analysis yet, but you can see above, we have a lot of the California populations, including um, the Columbia, and then the Lake Washington population is quite different as well as the Alaska population. And again, that Lake Washington population is, is I think, um, expected to be very different since they are landlocked. Um, but it'd be interesting to see how uh, the Nooksack River population fits in all of this. And then we did just get another um, uh, grant to start looking at the eDNA in, this, in the river system. So we really want to know how far up the river they're going and we can use eDNA to track them when they are spawning. Um, and we use our drone. <clears throat> this is our waterproof uh, and floatable drone although I wouldn't recommend that on the Nooksack River when it's running, but um, it's able to take pictures of the potential gravel uh, uh, areas where we think they might be spawning and help our uh, technicians get to these areas to do some sampling. So this is actually a photograph that the drone has taken. I really like uh, the photographs it takes. It's uh, they're very, um, they're very pretty. So this, this uh, sandbar up here is one of the main sandbars that we think that they might be spawning along. And so we want to take some uh, samples along this uh, gravel bar and see if we can use uh, WDFW's vortex method to uh, find uh, their eggs. But I do, I do also think that um, it's possible that unlike uh, you know, like surf smelt, when the tide goes out, you can't really get, you may not really be able to ac access their eggs as well as the surf smelt, because I think they are laying them underneath, you know, below the water and uh, the tide isn't going out to allow us um, access there. So um, we're still trying to figure out how to do that in a safe manner, because obviously the Nooksack River in the, in November can be quite dangerous. Um, so this is the vortex method uh, we have it out at the let me uh, at the Northwest Indian College. This is uh, just some pictures of the larvae uh, that we would like to find eventually as well. And I just wanted to end this by talking about our our overall goal for the longfin smelt is not one of um, trying to shut down the fishery per se. Um, it's one of trying to work with the, the biology of the longfin smelt and the people that have um, subsisted on it and had a relationship with this species um, since pre-contact. And the method um, that I keep hearing over and over is not one of management so much as it is reciprocation. How can we build a relationship with the longfin smelt that where we can reciprocate um, by protecting uh, their habitat, by potentially only harvesting female, or sorry, males, as they do with the herring in um, uh, the Helsinki Nation. Um, all of these are great ideas that we are still exploring. And um, yeah, so I just, I, I think that that's about everything. And I just want to say, Heishka, thank you for taking the time to be here today. And uh, thank you especially to Lummi Nation um, for allowing us to, to do this work. Um, and I, I uh, have lots of people to thank. So. Let's see. Well, thank you, Rachel. We do have one question, but first um, I wanted to check, we did have a poll that was set up. Did you still wanna do that or do you? Sure. Okay. Um, so I have them set up in two separate things so we can launch the first one, um, which is, have you ever heard of hooligans in the Nooksack River before? And of course, you probably all would answer yes now. <laughs> um, but what, Okay, yeah. Or, I thought that question was going to go up prior to the... <laughs> what would you answer before you saw this presentation? So again, questions in. Still going. 
I feel I'm having flashbacks <laughs> to watching the election. We're at 84. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> keep going, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anyone, a 90, anyone else? Anyone else going once, going twice? All right, I think we'll call it. Well, those are the results. Um, actually, sorry, I'm slow. This is Alice Sigurdsson. Yeah. So I grew up along the Nooksack River, and we uh, got hooligans above the Slater Road Bridge. And I'm curious, it, from a historical standpoint, how far up do you think those hooligans might have gone? I mean, I know you're saying now they're just below Marine uh, Marine Road, right? But how far do you think they might have gone based on historic recollection of farmers and people like me that definitely got them back in the day? Yeah, um, I have a record from just south of Ferndale. Um, that's in the University of Washington fish collection. And there is uh, some story of them going even farther than Ferndale. But Alice, if I could ask a question to you, how long ago was it that you got hooligans north of Slater Bridge? We got them when I was a kid, 1960s, 1960s, for sure. And maybe a little longer. Great, thank you. Um. So it looks like in the results, there were 64% that had not heard of them before. So hopefully a lot of people walk away from this with um, some new knowledge. And the next question was about um, fishing. Um, so I will administer that one and then I promise we'll get to the other questions. Because I'm curious. <laughs> I'm guessing the answer will probably be more no's than yeses, judged on how many people <laughs> were aware that they existed beforehand, but we're getting a few yeses. One yes, really. Okay, we're at 74%, 76, 79, 81, 83. Give you a few more moments. Any last going once, going twice? Okay, I'm gonna end the poll. And so I think you should be able to see the results. Um, so we had only two responses for yes and 95% saying no. Um, so cool. All right, um, so now we can, unless you had any comments on that, Rachel. I'd like to hear, so I, Alice had, had fished for him. Who is the other person that has? And maybe feel they don't have a feel microphone. Free to enter, yeah, feel free to enter it into the chat box. But if you want to re remain anonymous, that's okay too. Um, so we did have a question from the case. Um, that was, uh, Rachel, do you have a professional opinion whether there is a problem with adequate stream flows in the Nooksack in the dry months to support a healthy smelt population? So I think there's a lot of problems with the stream flow in the Nooksack River. I don't know that it is affecting the Nooksack uh, River hooligans at the moment um, because it's thought that they would um, hatch around January. Um, and at that time, there would theoretically still be enough flow because it's in the middle of winter where they would be pushed immediately out to the estuary and be fine. Um, but it's definitely a problem in California. But that, but that's the question. Like, well, then why are they spawning near to the mouth of the river, like the like the population in California, if stream flow isn't a problem? Thanks. Um, we had some thank yous and wonderful presentations. Um, and somebody mentioned that they only heard about them a week ago at Western. So <laughs> maybe they're growing in popularity. Um, so the Steve Shackerman had a question on what is the life history in the marine environment? 
So we only have some idea of what's happening in the California Delta region um, with that two with those two groups, the one where they stay in the estuary and one group moves out to the ocean. We have no idea what is happening here in Bellingham Bay, other than there are some records again in the U University of Washington fish collection in the 1940s where they collected um, a bunch of longfin smelt in the estuary in March. And these were obviously different size classes. So um, seems likely that there's at least uh, a group that is staying within the estuary. Thanks. Um, I think there's at least two more questions. Um, one is, what is the difference between eDNA and DNA? Uh, eDNA, uh, the, e, the little e stands for environmental DNA. So it's, it's DNA that you can collect um, just from the soil, from the water, from the air, from anywhere that's just kind of floating around versus when we usually look at DNA, where you're taking a sample from, you know, a person, a fish, you know, a targeted individual. And then another question we had was, do hooligans and salmon compete for spawning grounds? If so, how might bigger, stronger, oops, sorry, <laughs> how might bigger, stronger salmon affect the population of hooligans? No idea if they are, are competing. I would assume um, the chum would win out there. <laughs> but yeah, that's a good question. Um, another one was any evidence of genetic differences between the anadromous and the resident populations? Uh, just from the, uh, the California, the, that one unpublished um, graph I showed of the individual populations from California versus Alaska versus Lake Washington, that showed Lake Washington is very different. Um, the expectation is that when the Nooksack River population gets inputted, it's gonna actually be more closely related to those uh, populations from Oregon, uh, Columbia, than it would be to that Lake Washington. Cause once you, once you become landlocked, there's, there's really no gene flow there. I think that that might be all we had for questions. I'm always scanning to make sure I didn't miss somebody raising their hand or something else. So any last questions, feel free to raise your hand right now or type it into the, um, into the, uh, chat box. Otherwise, um, I'm sure, I don't know, Rachel, if you're hanging around a little bit longer, if someone had something that they entered into the chat box, um, you might be able to answer um, just by typing. Um, so with that, I think, uh, thank you so much. That was really informative and wonderful to hear. Um, I think everyone learned a lot, so we really appreciate that. Um, with that, I think we'll take a 10 minute break. Um, so get up, stretch, maybe take a short little walk around the block, go get another pot of coffee going or hot water for tea or get, you know, cookies or pastries, whatever you need um, and meet back here and um, we'll come back at 1110. So we'll see you then. All right. Thank you. Thanks everyone. All right, folks, it is 1110. So welcome back. I hope you got a good chance to stretch your legs, stand up, rest your eyes from staring at the screen. Um, and thank you for joining us back here again. So um, Lyle Anderson, who is a member of the Cherry Point Aquatic Reserve Citizen Search Committee is going to introduce our next speaker, John Bauer. So I'll let Lyle um, take it away. Good morning. Um, I trust you can hear me okay? Yes. Um, Okay, so uh, Dr. John Bauer has spent 40 years studying the natural world. Getting a start as a bird watcher, his research includes acoustic communication in bowhead whales and song sparrows, foraging competition between hummingbird species on a remote Chilean island, and the population ecology of Pacific Northwest marine birds. John has taught a wide variety of courses at, the, at, at Fairhaven, including environmental photography, the music and science of natural sound, the human-animal connection, evolutionary medicine, 
and the folk music experience. John is currently the Dean of WWU's Fairhaven College of Interdisciplinary Studies and recommends that your children and grandchildren <laughs> consider attending Fairhaven. It's a great college. <laughs> and uh, also I have it on good authority, Facebook, if you can believe it, that uh, if you need someone to save a hummingbird that has managed to get into your house, then Dr. John is your man. <laughs> thank you, Lyle. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. And um, boy, I forgot I put that in there about your children and grandchildren. But let me also say that Fairhaven College, which is really an amazing place, we're launching a new website Monday. Um, Fairhaven is a, um, we have many mature learners. And so if you're a mature learner, you're also welcome at Fairhaven College. <laughs> so there you go. Um, <laughs> that's one way uh, my deanship's going to affect this talk. Uh, the other way is that my life has been so crazy. Um, so I'm just joining this morning, uh, which I'm sorry I wasn't here for the earlier talk and other things, but tis the way my life is going right now. Um, I'm sitting outside on my, in my dean's office, which is otherwise known as the deck off of our bedroom. And um, so if you hear birds, there's a couple of flickers, for instance, having a good time on a telephone pole. Um, if you hear birds, that's, that's why. And there is, if I get really boring, you'll notice there's a hummingbird feeder right above me. And here comes a hummingbird, actually. I just had a little chase. So you can always watch that. Well, I'm going to talk about the role of marine birds in the Cherry Point food web. <clears throat> and what is a food web? Um, a food web is an interlocking and interdependent uh, set of food chains. Um, what's a food chain? That's what the word was when I was in college. And essentially a food change, uh, a food change chain is the movement of energy from one trophic level to the next. Um, so for instance, starting with plankton here, I assume you can see my cursor uh, moving up to, um, to other species that forage on the plankton, moving up in this case to salmon, which goes up to the apex predator, which is the seal. So one set of lines through this small food web um, is um, is a food chain and when you put them all together you get well let's say there are many different food chains of course this one it's rather odd that the arrows are going the wrong direction really because things should be flowing up uh, not down <laughs> energy is flowing up uh, from phytoplankton to zooplankton to in this case forage fish and then up to the apex predators um, so you could create a whole bunch of different food chains for each one of these apex predators. Um, and as we start to put it all together, we get a food web. Um, and as you might imagine, uh, these things can get complicated. So here's a, a depiction of a Salish Sea food web where we have many, many species. And look at all the lines between all the species. Um, that's um, And uh, ecologists uh, who study these things are very interested in these lines since the study of ecology is the interactions of species. Um, these lines um, can all be studied in terms of how energy moves from one uh, species to another or from one trophic level. So all of these critters down here up into higher trophic levels and um, yeah, so, so um, it turns out, not surprisingly, that this is a, that a food web is a very complicated uh, mess, as I call it up here. And if you really want to have some fun, you can get into uh, how energy flows through a food web. Um, my undergraduate in the 1980s, uh, I worked with a person who was a, a student of Eugene Odom. Um, and Eugene Odom was one of the first people to think of ecosystems uh, through the lens of flows of energy. And so in this, uh, and I, I, I have to say, uh, um, I was, I did a, some of this in, this morning, so I did not, 
you know, do a very nice job of citing some sources. You're just going to have to believe me. If you want to know a source, you can always contact me and I can let you know. But, um, but basically here we're looking at how, in this case, benthic energy. So the, the energy that is, uh, produced, uh, by benthic organisms flows up through, um, different food webs. In this case, you know, the top uh, species are over here. Um, and so this is, and, 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 uh, I assume if I actually went and read the study, which I didn't, I just stole the graphic, uh, that the authors would be quantifying the amount of flow going between these different species and these different trophic levels. Um, I don't know how you're doing, uh, you know, questions and that kind of thing. Uh, I guess we can wait till the end. Um, if you want to ask a question, I, you can throw it in the chat and um, maybe uh, Eleanor could just alert me if there's one I should be thinking about. Um, I see the chat in here, um, so I'll put it over here to the left. Uh, I can I can help you out with that if I see Okay, you. thank you. Yeah, because it's hard to watch the chat and do all the rest of this stuff. Um, the other thing, by the way, this morning that's been a little complicating is it seems that we may have a president-elect uh, of the United States. And while I'm not allowed or interested in making any political statements here, I, I, um, I have heard that the uh, president-elect, according to the New York Times, is a little more friendly towards the environment than the last president of the United States. But I'll just leave that. So, of course, I've been getting my family. Everyone's going crazy on me. So it's all good. Here we go. So uh, setting the food web table, uh, for the Cherry Point area, which is where we're headed towards, um, and marine birds. Um, we start with the Salish Sea uh, abiotic environment. In other words, all the stuff that's not alive. And the length of the coastline, 7.5 thousand um, kilometers, 7 kilometers uh, Islands, 419 sea surface area is hidden by my control panel. Oh, there it is. Um, 16,000 square kilometers of, of sea surface. Um, very complex, right? So, so one thing about the Salish Sea is that it's a highly productive um, uh, system, which means it traps much of this, a lot of sun's energy and then moves that energy through the different trophic levels. Okay, so why is it so productive? Well, uh, one reason is that there's more than a dozen large rivers delivering nutrients from the mountains, from uh, lowland areas, um, and, and those rivers also are providing power for mixing. So the, the delta of the Nooksack and Bellingham Bay great example. You can go down and watch all of this happen after a big rainstorm. Uh, Bellingham Bay gets brown. You can see the movement of water into the bay that's mixing everything up. Um, coastal upwelling, and this is along the real coast, the Olympic coast, the uh, um, west side of Vancouver Island. In the summer, uh, it delivers nutrients from the bottom of the water up to the top, which allows phytoplankton uh, to have nutrients uh, in order to photosynthesize and 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 set the table for the whole system, um, and um, and I sp I should mention by the way that uh, the key one key to productivity is having nutrients available to phytoplankton. Okay, and uh, for those of you, probably all of you, have been to Hawaii uh, or some other beautiful tropical place uh, with the blue water. Um, what you see a few things. One is that the water's blue, whereas in the Salish Sea, the water's typically murky. Um, and another thing you see, for instance, is there, unless you're on a reef, there aren't very many gulls or even other types of marine birds. And that's telling you that the productivity of that area is actually low, even though it's in the tropics. The reason for that is that the nutrients get trapped at the bottom of the ocean. There's this bizarre thing that water does. Um, and when water heats up, it forms a thermocline, which separates warm surface water from cold 
bottom water, and the water actually doesn't mix very much at all. And so, for instance, when a whale dies, a humpback out there in Hawaii, uh, it goes to the bottom of the ocean, it decomposes, but those nutrients are trapped at the bottom. They are not available to the phytoplankton, uh, who need also to be up in the light in order to photosynthesize. So, so, um, so that's why that water looks so nice. Um, and our water doesn't look so nice. And so these are the factors that bring those nutrients up. So um, another one is five cubic miles of water exchanges with every tidal exchange. So, uh, so that's, we're talking about a box there that's five miles on a side. Uh, that much water is moving in and out of the Salish Sea uh, with each tidal change. And then we have lots and lots of wind, which provides mixing, which mixes stuff up from the bottom. Um, and then our water is cold. And so for the most part, um, we don't get thermoclines happening in the Salish Sea with some exceptions like Hood Canal. So, um, um, so, so the abiotic environment sets up a system that is highly productive. And that's what, one reason we like to live here, and that's one reason everything else likes to live here. Um, so here we are, the rivers, all the different rivers bringing in nutrient sediment and powering mixing. Here's a diagram of coastal upwelling that's driven by uh, winds out of the north in the summer that run parallel to the coast. And then I think it's through the Borealis effect, although it's been a while since I took that exam. Um, it, it tends to um, move water, uh, surface water away from the uh, coast, which brings the nutrient rich water up from the bottom of the ocean. And here's a little diagram that just shows the green, or as we get above zero here, that's when we're upwelling on the coast. When we're over here, that's when it's downwelling, that's when water's moving down. From along the coast and um, somehow or other the months disappeared. But believe me, this is the summer and this is when upwelling happens. Coinciding, of course, when we have longer days, a lot of sunlight. And so again, a very productive system. Tides. This is the only photograph um, in this whole talk that is my talk. In a little bit, we're gonna see jo some of Joe Mesh's local uh, bird photographer uh, par excellence, um, his photos will be featured, but uh, tides, and this is Birch Bay, um, and with our great blue herons. Okay, and um, all right, so let's go through the menu, and the first menu is the hors d'oeuvres, uh, and the hors d'oeuvres are the phytoplankton that are using those nutrients, that are using those um, uh, that sunlight um, to to trap sun energy and um, and photosynthesize. So bringing, fixing carbon, um, building more phytoplankton that drives the whole system. And this plot, um, so I didn't download everything today. This one I stole a while ago, but I still don't know what the reference is. So I apologize, I'm getting old, whatever. Um, and uh, this is showing where you see the red, this is where phytoplankton blooms are happening in various places, um, I believe in the Salish Sea. And so you can see one important fact thing to realize here is that uh, we have so much, such a diverse ecosystem here that phytoplankton blooms have, have different patterns in different places within the Salish Sea. And then they also have different patterns um, um, from year to year as well, depending on what's going on with um, mixing and uh, freshwater input and those kinds of things. But overall, lots of phytoplankton blooms. And then, so who's eating that phytoplankton? Well, there's a lot of stuff, but uh, primarily zooplankton. And these are the um, larval stages of barnacles, uh, all the other invertebrates which exist in just unbelievable numbers. Oh, there's a Stellar's Jay on the roof right behind me. Um, there it is. Yeah, nice. And um, um, so, so barnacles, um, crabs, all kinds of different critters. Uh, and then, um, so 
Um, the salad of the Salish Sea is largely eelgrass. Uh, eelgrass is uh, herbivores uh, such as uh, geese, ducks, some kinds of ducks uh, love to eat eelgrass, as we'll see in a minute. And um, so then we move on to the uh, second course of the meal, and this would be the forage fish, the forage fish uh, eating the zooplankton and sometimes smaller fish. Uh, of which herring, sand lance, and surf smelt are important ones. And continuing with the second course, in other words, we're partway up through the trophic web. Uh, our intertidal and benthic uh, invertebrates, such as mussels and clams, barnacles, um, and all the other creatures you see in the intertidal zone. And then uh, in this region, a critically important for birds um, um, resource, food resource, or herring spawn. And we'll uh, look at that in a minute. Okay, now we'll do a brief aside um, and ask the question, how are marine birds doing? What is the status of marine birds worldwide? Uh, whoops, that's not supposed to be there. Okay, um, so uh, this is a study that was done in 2012. I actually have a reference, good for me. Um, and what we can see is about half of all that birds you hear is noisy crow. Um, I don't know, it's legal to feed crows, right? I can admit that I do. And uh, I have a crow pair. Uh, who visit frequently, so that's noisy crow. Anyway, um, the uh, half of the species uh, of marine birds in the world are suffering uh, significant uh, population declines, uh, particularly pelagic birds, meaning things like albatross that spend all or most almost all of their time out in the open oceans, but also coastal residents, and that for us that would mean uh, cormorants, um, um, possibly gulls, uh, other species, um, our, our elcid species like um, rhinoceros auklets. Um, and then the coastal non-breeding visitors, these are, so less of these, about a third of these species are declining significantly in the world. Of course, there's a lot of them that are also just simply unknown. We, we don't have data on them, so it's important to realize, but um, and and for our region, okay, most of the species that are he present here are present in the non-breeding season. Most of the species of birds, and they come here from Alaska, of course, uh, and and other uh, Arctic and subarctic areas. They come here from the Great Plains, uh, the Northern Great Plains, like dabbling ducks. Um, and also uh, some grebes. Uh, they come here, we even have a species called Hearman's gull that uh, nests in the Sea of Cortez in uh, Mexico and comes up to this region uh, for the summer, basically after they breed in February and March. So we are, uh, um, the, the real importance of this area, well, it's also important for resident breeders, but we're very, very important for birds that are migrating from other regions. Okay, so uh, how's it going locally? I just have one slide, which will be you will see to be thankful for if you've seen my other talks. I won't go through all that again. But I did a study in 2003, 2005 with a, a whole uh, army of undergraduates, um, including about 13 undergraduates who were, uh, high, and, a, and a grad student, who were highly skilled at bird identification. And we basically repeated the 1970s MESA study where they went out and counted birds all over this region. Each of these dots shows the place that birds were counted in the 1970s from the shore. We counted them from the same places in the mid 2000s. Where you see red is where um, there are declines of more than 50% of all in all the species uh, that were there in the 70s, uh, less than 50% of the n total number of birds were there in the 2000s. And you can see, by the way, as long as we're looking at it, that Cherry Point scores quite a bit of red. 
The Cherry Point area scores quite a bit of red. Uh, yellow is less than 50%. Um, and then green is where there actually are increases in birds. The Samish Bay area, for instance. Uh, the big reason for that is that's a very popular spot for dabbling ducks. And dabbling duck populations have gone up since the 1970s, particularly because of habitat reclamation in the northern Great Plains. Um, but you can also see, um, and I should have asked, done a poll, but you know, I'm running out of time. Uh, and why I bother? You can just see that where the blues are primarily concentrated are in the San Juan Islands and the greens, which means an increase, but not, hey, noisy crow, tomorrow. Geesh. Um, they get so spoiled. Um, the greens are, um, and the blues are concentrated in the San Juans. And what do we know about the San Juans? Well, we know that San Juans have more um, uh, regulation on development, particularly shoreline development, lower populations, less industrial effect. So, so um, this, the, the study we did um, tells a lot of different stories and that's a key one. Overall, however, when you take all the species together, you get about a 29% decline in total number of birds. Um, and if we break that down by uh, feeding guilds, so now we're gonna introduce another concept, it's very straightforward, and that is basically, you can classify uh, uh, animals by what they eat, basically. And in this region, we have benthivores, I'm going to show you in a minute, herbivores, omnivores, piscivores, and planktivores. And in our results from this study, we found that planktivores of the nine species that were common here, um, and this is including both resident species and migratory species, three had statistically significant declines. Uh, the herbivores were doing just fine. The omnivores, three of the four were suffering declines. The piscivores, six of the 14 were suffering declines, and the planktivores, um, two out of two were suffering declines. And then you can see the numbers of species that were actually increasing uh, with statistically significant increases. So when you look at the, um, and we're gonna, I'm gonna go through some of these species in a minute, but when you look at the, um, the overall picture here, um, there are more statistically significant declines than increases. And um, some of the increases are, I don't know if I'd say like good, but you know, they're species that we've been concerned with or may be concerned with nationally, like common loons, for instance. Um, other species like this one herbivore that uh, went up um, significantly is Canada goose, which is because essentially it's an invasive species now that breeds here and stays here. And by the way, uh, one of the, I get a lot of questions now that uh, I'm more connected to the world through social media. And one of the biggest questions is, why do I see geese flying north, south, east, and west? So I'm going to answer that question right now. Um, two reasons. One reason, maybe that's two. We'll find out if there's a third before I get there. But anyway, reason number one is that Canada geese are invasive. They're residents. They're flying left. They're flying right. They're going from Lake Whatcom to Lake Terrell. They're just doing what they do. They're not migrating. They're, they're, it, and there are some migrating Canada geese, but most of the ones you see flying around are, are residents. So they're just going basically to the store, whichever store they want to go to. Um, so that's one... That's one reason. The other reason is that we are the end point for many migrating uh, geese, like snow geese um, and, and related things like um, trumpeter swans. Um, we, are, we are the wintering grounds, the Skagit um, up at Weiser Lake. And so when you see trumpeter swans, as I saw this morning, flying east, they're doing the same thing. They're here for the winter. They're moving from one spot to another. We, we are not like, uh, say you were in Minnesota, where the geese would be flying from north to south the entire month of October, or where I'm from, upstate New York. It's pretty much the same deal. So so um, just so you know, I'm, I'm going to answer that one because, man, I've been getting that question. Like, that's, that's the leading question of 2020. Um, Okay, so I want to go. I'm going to go back to this because it's out of place. Censusing birds, CPAR. So since I think 2013, there's been a wonderful um, citizen science 
effort to census birds in CPAR in the um, Cherry Point Aquatic Reserve. Um, there's three locations that are counted from for this uh, one I'm going to show you here. I've concentrated on the Gulf Road uh, census site and the Neptune Beach because those are the two that actually look at the aquatic reserve itself. Uh, the Sandy Point site uh, it doesn't really look at the aquatic reserve, so I've taken that out of the little bit of data analysis I pulled off for today. All right, um, but before I get to that citizen science study, uh, what I also want to show you is just from that 70s to mid 2000s study, how did the Cherry Point area do compared to the whole study? In other words, we in the whole study, we had about a 29% decrease in total number of birds. What was the total at Cherry Point? Well, it's down over 70% at Cherry Point, whereas the whole study is down 29%. So the Cherry Point area suffered greater declines between the 1970s and the 2000s. Okay, so looking a little differently at this, how did the Cherry Point area do compared to nearby waters? And so I grabbed one uh, census area that was south of Cherry Point and Sandy Point, and well, Cherry Point area, and uh, two that were north, uh, all important places. And you can see Cherry Point uh, was down a lot. Sandy Point was down a lot. Drayton Harbor was not down as much, and Birch Bay was not down as much, neither was Hales Pass. So just a quick look at, at uh, how Cherry Point has been impacted. Um, well, of course, we can talk about why those numbers have gone down, um, but, um, you know, most people think that the industrialization of that area, the changes to eelgrass beds, the, the decrease in eelgrass beds uh, was an important part, um, but especially also the loss of herrings, we will see. Okay, so now looking more closely again from the 70s versus 2000 species, I'm grabbing a bunch of species. These were the ones that um, the citizen science group concentrated on for the first few years and just going species by species again looking at the whole study versus cherry point we can see that by and large um, um, cherry point area was uh, affected more for most of these species than um, than um, uh, the rest of the study than were found in the rest of the study okay Maybe, I, well, I don't want to stop. Let's let's keep rolling, keep your questions. Eleanor, um, interrupt me if, if, it, if there's something I really should be talk, talking about or answering right now. Um, so let's go back to uh, trophic levels and food webs and feeding guilds and look at today's diners. And for this part of the talk, I'm going to feature Joe Mesh's photographs. There's a number of fabulous bird photographers in this area. Um, and I won't name them because I'll forget somebody. But Joe kindly made his photos available to me. And so um, I'll use them in this talk. This is a northern pintail and it's typical northern pintail uh, pose, which is a dabbling duck pose where they tip up and they're eating vegetation and whatever else they can find um, below them. All right. So getting back to it, uh, feeding guilds, planktivores, herbivores, benthivores, piscivores, and scavengers, and here they all are examples of them. Planktivores, so our major planktivore, we, we don't have a lot of planktivores here. Uh, marbled murelets do some planktivore, uh, other, other uh, elsids do, and, um, but this is a Bonaparte's gull in breeding plumage, picture Joe took of just going along the surface with its bill in the water, kind of like black skimmers, uh, which is what, well, Bonaparte's gulls are awesome. Black skimmers would be nice if anyone wants to bring any back in a suitcase. No, don't do that, that's illegal. Um, anyway, so um, so this is a species that Bonaparte's gulls that are, are um, here in largely the spring and the fall during migration, but some are around in the summer. 
um, or especially late summer. And that's what they look like up close and personal. It's a beautiful bird, one of my faves. Um, has some wonderful sound too. Okay, moving right on to the herbivores. So one of our major winter herbivores is brant, brant goose. And uh, there's a brant that Joe got a photo of uh, eating uh, eelgrass, which is what they like to eat. Now for some of these species, I have, I'm have i going to use data from the citizen science um, study. And um, the, the, the apology I'm about to make is to these the poor wonderful people who do CPAR like Lyle and others. And I was going to try to get this data all up to date. I just couldn't do it. There are too many crises COVID related at my university and other things that I just couldn't, couldn't do it. Um, so unfortunately, but I make a solemn vow that when the quarter ends and the craziness stops a little, um, I'm going to get that data updated and I will plan a talk with resources and Audubon, anybody who wants that takes a total look at the data uh, that's been um, gathered by the CPAR folks, because you certainly deserve it. And I apologize, but I'm going to use data I analyzed uh, earlier, a few years ago, that only looks at the first couple of years of um, the CPAR citizen science study. So uh, here's Flying Brant. And basically what we're looking, this is all data from those two locations, um, one Gulf Road and one uh, Neptune Beach. And what we see here is in the 70s, there were not uh, Brant there. Uh, most of the Brant were further south in Padilla Bay. And in the mid 2000s, we counted quite a lot of Brant, 50 Brant per visit to that area. And those visits go from September till June. So, um, so, and, uh, so a lot of, fair number of Brant. And then what we see here in the 2013 to 2015 is essentially a stable result because these are error bars. And you know, the simple way to do this is extend your error bars around. And what you find is that it looks like a decrease, but statistically speaking, it's not, we don't know for sure. When I get a few more years of data into this, then we actually may be able to find, uh, be better at looking for statistically significant changes in the Cherry Point area um, since the mid 2000s. Um, John, we had a few questions. I was trying to find a good spot too. Yeah, good, thank you. Um, so one question was, why are Canada geese breeding in the Salish Sea region now? What changed that altered their life history? Thank you, and and it's very simple, um, and, and you know, someone may know better than I do because I only know from talking to people. But but basically, somebody was up in the Arctic, and they um, and they decided, you know, I'm going to bring back some Canada goose eggs and hatch them and put them out on my golf course, and they're going to be so beautiful walking around. And um, they did that, and those Canada geese bred, and their kids were like looked around, you know, because geese imprint. Um, I keep that sun out of the screen. And they um, they looked around and they said, wow, we're home on the tundra. And so they felt no urge to migrate anywhere. And then they had kids and then they had kids because, you know, golf courses and city parks are great places for geese. People feed them food even, you know. And so basically what happened was we as humans, modern humans established a resident population of Canada geese. And, and so that's why the Canada geese are here. And now, of course, like in the Seattle area, they're problematic. They're on the soccer fields and fouling the beaches and all of that. But that's the reason why. Thank you. What, what else did you have for me, Eleanor? There's another one that, well, there's two more. Um, one is when you compare the entire study with the Cherry Point area, did you remove the Cherry Point data from the entire data if you did not, then the differences would have been increased if CO, I'm not sure what that. Um, yeah. CO. Cherry Point. If Cherry Point, it was a typo. Sorry. No, that's okay. If Cherry Point was not in the denominator. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, yes, I did. Um, I took those out. Uh, thank you. That's a very good question. But yes, I took the Cherry Point data out of the whole study and just used the whole study except for Cherry Point, 
which which is you're correct that's the right way to do it and i'll tell you it's amazing um how many times not like real science papers but let's say other stuff uh doesn't do that uh, including political stuff i've seen that um yes but i did take that out so thanks for thanks for asking that it's a good question and, then, and number three um actually there's two more still um do you think the brants came north if they got too crowded down in Padilla bay it isn't about being crowded so so i don't know the answer to this um brant clearly have moved north and and it's not just um the cherry point area it's it's also up into canada there's uh, so i did a paper after this study and then i included um a christmas bird count data and um the uh, and one of the things that was really striking is Canadian Christmas bird counts had Brant, just like Cherry Point, um, showing up in like the 90s or something like that, and then becoming consistent residents. Meanwhile, Padilla Bay has had a decrease in Brant. I assume this has to do with a decrease in eelgrass um, in Padilla Bay, but I actually don't know data for that. So I'm just sort of guessing about that. Oh, is that one of my crows? Anyway, yeah, so um, so that's a really good question. I can't say I definitively have the answer, um, but uh, it's clear that the Brant are wintering farther north, uh, but not extremely far north, just, you know, along the southern coast of BC and, and here. Um, so does that have something to do with climate change? I, I really don't know, but it's a great question. Thank you. Um, and then there was a question from earlier about um, one of the phytoplankton photos. Um, uh, it was about what kind of phytoplankton it was, square or something. <laughs> 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 and maybe you might not know either. There's so many different types of plankton out there. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I believe, and and I, you know, when I do a marine a Salish Sea course, I always have to restudy this every time. Old get my brain's getting uh, old and rigid. But I believe most of our um, phytoplankton are diatoms. Um, um, someone else can jump in and say, um, but I'm I'm not. Yeah, I always have to look at the guides to figure out what's what. So I'm not much help there. And then, sorry, there was another question that came in. Sure. <laughs> Great. Uh, asking if you can provide a reference for the Mesa comparison work, and that's something that we can send out in a post email too. But if sure. you have anything that you wanted to say now, otherwise we can send that out after this. Yeah, no, we can send it out. It's um, I wrote a paper that um, based on my students and my research that um, I won't go into the story of the paper, but um, I'll just say that. Um, it's pretty much the thing I'm most proud of in my career, besides teaching folk music to many, many students, um, teaching them how to play instruments. Um, it's, um, yeah, it, it's a paper that really came together well. Um, an incredible example of citizen science, I think, if you include my students as the citizens. And, um, um, yeah, and, and we can make that available to everybody. It's actually a readable paper as well, um, I like to think. I'm giving myself way too much credit than I deserve here, but I'll I'll take it since I'm offering it. Um, any more, Eleanor? That's it for now. Thanks. Okay, great. And I hope everybody's doing okay. You know, Zoom land is weird. I've learned to just carry on until people tell me they're not doing okay. So um, feel free to tell me if you're not doing okay. Moving on to the benthivores, and these are white wing scoters, which I'm going to tell a little story about in a minute, but. Um, beautiful, beautiful birds. Uh, the, by the way, if you want to know where the best place is to go see beautiful, beautiful marine birds up close, send me a quarter and I'll tell you. No, I'm kidding. Um, the, the pier at Marine Park in Blaine is the best place to see marine birds up close, in my opinion. They swim right by the pier and it's just on a nice day in the winter, uh, you can, well, it's cold. <laughs> but anyway, that's my, that's my go-to spot with new people and new students um, because the birds get so close. But these are white wing scoters, Joe's picture, beautiful birds. Um, and I'm gonna talk about them in a minute. Uh, here's some sea power data, a common golden eye. And this is a species that uh, went down 
between 70s and the um, and th and this is all Cherry Point data uh, and the mid 2000s and then has gone up between um, those two dates, those two uh, periods of time. Now, again, this this is only two years of data. So once I get the other years in there, we may be able to say something uh, more definitive about common golden eyes. What I can say, so, well, let me just say this overall, um, a big citizen science project uh, run by Seattle Audubon, I help them set it up, is, um, um, is, has been showing stability since the mid 2000s. My study showed a big drop from the 70s to the 2000s. And I think by and large, the cherry point data shows the same type of stability. Uh, w there are some species like Western grebes, but by and large species have been fairly stable since the uh, mid 2000s, which is really, really good, right? I mean, stability is good, even if it's lower numbers and being stable. This is Barrow's golden eye, another common benthivore. Um, we, I don't have data in the talk. All right, we're going to get on to the scoters here who are benthivores. This is a surf scoter about to uh, ingest a clam, which is pretty crazy. You can watch this. A great place to watch this is Semiamu Beach, which is my other go-to spot, especially if the wind is strong from the west or the southwest and you go on the um, bay, the Drayton Harbor side, um, the, the birds don't want to be in the wind particularly, and so they get very close to shore, and you can watch them feeding. It's just, it's, it's I mean, let me just say this to all you people, um, Rachel, if you're still out there who study fish and stuff, that's all very nice, but seriously, this is the best thing ever. So, sorry. Anyway, so here we have a look at surf scoters. I have to move my little menu out of the way. Um, and this is where you see a huge drop in the Cherry Point area. And I think you can see that quite clearly, right? Okay. And that, uh, now it's bothering me. There we go. And so here is a plot uh, based, and again, we're now I'm looking at that study from the 70s to the mid 2000s. And you can see that on April 30th, 1978, uh, the Mesa people, people out counting the birds, saw 40 thousand surf scoters in the Cherry Point Aquatic Reserve area. When we went out on April 30th, 2004, we saw 139 and so on and so forth. So there's been a big change there. And why is that? Um, that's because the herring stock of Cherry Point has crashed. This data only goes through 2010. I think there's been some recovery uh, since then, but I, I didn't have time to find that data. Um, but the big crash in herring that are breeding at Cherry Point, which if you've been involved in Cherry Point stuff at all, I'm sure you know about, because it's kind of the biggest news from Cherry Point. Um, and this is uh, uh, data that was generated by Eric Anderson and his PhD research. And basically what it's showing is that uh, male surf scoters uh, in December, they weigh this much. By February, they've lost quite a bit of weight. Okay, so they're not maintaining their weight. And then when the spawn happens, when the herring spawn happens, they gain a lot of weight. Okay, and the same thing here for female surf scoters. And, and why, why is that important to them? That's, that's important. Well, here's, uh, here's where the herring spawns are up the coast. They tend to be timed one after another, although there's some variation in that. Why is this important? Because they need to put that weight on so they can migrate successfully to the to the Northwest Territories where they breed and have um, and successfully raise kids. And so what Eric did was he captured um, captured birds in these three places. There's Eric out capturing birds and puts a little um, satellite tag in them, and then the data goes from here. Uh, to a satellite to France. Why France? I don't. I think just because Eric likes to go to France. I'm not sure, but um, no. This was in the early days of satellite tags, and what Eric, amongst a lot of other bird biologists, did this too. They found that these birds that are taking advantage of the food web here, and in particular herring spawn, then migrate pretty much directly up into the Northwest Territories to breed. Okay, and so the having 
uh, a healthy herring spawn is critical to scoters in this area in particular. Those are the white wing scoters. The surf scoters tend to go up the coast more and then go into their breeding places. But, but either way, um, they really um, rely, especially surf scoters, on the herring spawn. And they actually time their movement up the coast based on uh, when spawning events typically happen. Okay, so if we look at the, the, and don't worry about black scoters, they're pretty unusual here, but if we look at surf scoters versus white wing scoters, this is data from the 70s to the 2000s, um, we see a big increase in white wing scoters, a big decrease in surf scoters, and this is because there's an invasive clam, the varnish clam, that's a big clam, and white wing scoters can eat it, and surf scoters' bills are too small to deal with it, and so white wing scoters have gone up. They're doing very well in this region. Surf scoters are, are not doing well in this region. Okay, and there's a white wing scoter. Another species we have data for are harlequin ducks. And here, this is a happier story. Um, and one thing I should point out is I'm not talking about the entire population of the species. I'm talking about the abundance of the species here in this region. Okay, that's an important distinction. Um, but harlequin ducks actually went up between the 70s and the mid-2000s, and they've been stable since. And so that's that's a really awesome thing because it's a beautiful duck, and it's a uh, endemic to the northwest. This is long-tailed ducks. I don't have CPAR data for it to show you today, <clears throat> but it's a beautiful uh, benthivore. And then um, buffleheads. I also don't have data today, but I wanted to show them to you male and female. Uh, and now the piscivores, the fish eaters. This is, um, <clears throat> this is a, a guillemot. And uh, these are marbled murelets. So I could show you marbled murelet data. Basically, we don't see them at CPAR, but if we had been here uh, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, we would see them there uh, because they nest in old growth forests. So each species has its own story. <clears throat> um, but we do have data for common loons, and this is really kind of interesting data. So in the mid-70s, it went up to the 2000s and has continued to go up in the Cherry Point area um, in the 2013-2015. Uh, so um, common loons are a happy story for this region. Other species of loons, Pacific loon, red-throated loon, exist here also. Uh, and then this is one of the most beautiful things, I think, in the Northwest, and that's loon congregations in the spring. There's a lot of singing going on. It's, it's a wonderful thing to see, worth going to check out. Other piscivores include double-crested cormorants, pelagic cormorants, western grebes. I don't, I'm not sure why I don't have data for western grebes. They have decreased by 95% since the uh, 70s, and they continue to be in very small numbers in this region. This is a bird um, that's been impacted tremendously, like marbled murelets. I'm rushing a little here because I want to have time, more time for your questions. And there's what Western grebes look like. It's um, uh, um, another grebe is the redneck grebe. Similarly, about an 88% drop. Um, Red-breasted mergansers, a fish-eating duck, um, doing fine. Finally, the scavengers, and of course our glaucous wing gull, always entertaining, and bald eagles. What a great photo. And um, I guess that's, is that a Hearman's gull? I don't know what that is. I, one of you hotshot birders can tell me. And uh, bald eagles have gone up in the Cherry Point area. Um, they've also gone up across the whole region, uh, as we know. Okay, um, Oh yeah, that's it. And um, I want to thank uh, my Marine Bird Census team, the DNR Marine Bird Census team. Um, I think it's DNR. Maybe it's Fish and Wildlife. I don't know. I think it's Fish and Wildlife. And the um, and the CPAR Census team. Uh, and I always want to thank Terry Wall, uh, who helped me get started in marine studies when I moved out here in the late 1990s, and has been um, has been very important to my work. Uh, thank you, and I'm ready for more questions. Great, okay. thanks so much. Um, it's definitely different meeting over Zoom than in person, but it's 
I particularly appreciated getting to meet all of the birds of John Bauer's backyard. So that was a nice little <laughs> treat. Um, so just a reminder, you can type your um, questions into the chat box or you can raise your hand and I'll try to monitor to make sure I don't miss anyone raising their hand. If you're on the phone, um, it's star six to unmute and uh, star nine to raise your hand. So there is a question um, that is, so nutrients, nutrient inputs from abundant seabirds, cormorant skulls affect growth of kelp and other marine plants? Thank you. Yeah. And I, I meant to have that in there. Um, absolutely. However, um, I would say that the dabbling ducks are the big ones because, uh, and geese, uh, because they, they go to um, farm fields and whatnot. And they, they, and there's such big numbers of dabbling ducks like widgeon, pintails, uh, mallards. Um, and then they come out and spend uh, a lot of times in the evenings or other times they're they're in the saltwater intertidal zones and whatnot and shallow waters and and so they bring a ton of nutrients out um the other birds not so much because they're mostly foraging in the marine environment and then their waste is going back into the marine environment so what they are they're recycling nutrients right they're taking them out of the forage fish, for instance, for piscivores, they're taking them out of the forage fish um, trophic level and recycling them back into nutrients. But they're not necessarily a net input of nutrients, right? Yeah. Thank you. Um, any other, I'm not seeing any other questions, but sometimes it takes folks a moment to um, type or think of their questions. Um, I guess one question that I would pose is um, for those who might not really be into birding yet, but are interested, what are maybe some great local places or things to do to um, get involved? Yeah, well, the North Cascades Audubon Society um, is fabulous and offers field trips. I don't know that they're offering field trips right now or not. I, uh, I, anybody know? I'm sure somebody knows. Yeah, Robert K might know, um, but we do have another question. Um, well, well, before you go, before you go to the other question, let me just say that those field trips are incredible. They're free. They're wonderful. Join the North Cascades Audubon Society. Go on the field trips because the thing about identifying and learning about birds is it's really just like any other thing. Really, it's really hard to do it just using a field guide. Like it's just really hard to do. But when you can go out with people who know the birds and see them over time, this is true for water birds or land birds, that's when you, um, that's when you really have the opportunity to learn them. And so take advantage of those field trips. Um, someday when I retire, I'll start doing those field trips. Um, right now, my life, well, my life's always crazy. It's just how it is. But um, yeah. And then a few folks uh, also mentioned that uh, the field trips are very limited at this time, but stay tuned. Um, NCAS, which stands for North Cascade Audubon Society, is now offering trips to Semiamu, but in limited numbers um, with registration required due to COVID. Um, field trips and marine bird courses on Zoom are also being offered November 21st, 2 okay. to 4 p.m. Um, so be sure to check that out. Um, there was another question um, that was, how are declines in bird species affecting other parts of the food chain? Yeah, so um, I, the, ans the real answer to that is, I don't think anybody really knows very well. I mean, it, it's so complex. And, um, and so for instance, Western grebes there used to be as many as 10,000 Western grebes in Bellingham Bay in the winter, 10,000 Western grebes. So you have to imagine, since they're fish eaters, they were having an impact on fish, you know? <laughs> I mean, they had to have been, and now they're gone. So, so clearly um, that's releasing a pressure on fish. Now, on the other hand, you know, we've got a uh, harbor well, they, they eat different fish, I guess. So that's not really fair. But I was going to say seals have plump gone through the roof. And so, so I guess, you know, I don't really know. And I'm not sure that anybody really has an excellent clue on, on just how um, 
uh, how impactful these declines are. And then, of course, at the other hand, the herbivores are doing great, right? And so that means a lot of eelgrass is getting eaten. So there's, there's so much complexity to it. Um, I, I'm just not really sure in this region what, what uh, the effect is. Um, we have another question about maybe changing diets in scoters. So um, the comment was interesting that pictures of the scoters were relative to clams, but during the herring years when they were abundant, they were obviously feeding on eggs. Seems like a change in diet. Oh, thank you. And that's just me not being clear. Um, and I meant to be more clear. The clams are their diet for most of the winter. And when the herring spawn happens in the spring, they switch to the herring spawn. And the reason is the herring spawn is an incredible energy input, right? Uh, Stellar's J on the roof right there. And um, <laughs> I put peanuts up there. I, I kind of have to admit to my, um, my feet, whatever. Anyway, I won't go into my little tirade about feeding birds. Just feed them. They love it. Um, it's a net. No one knows. It's kind of a... The, the data shows it's kind of a wash, like it helps them as much as it hurts them, whatever. But um, I don't know what to say about it. Um, feed them because they're beautiful, enjoyable. Yeah, so um, um, so they're eating clams most of the winter, and then they switch to the herring spawn and when the spawn occurs. Um, but again, real so so they they can't just um, they can't just switch over. To clams, okay. There's no herring spawn. I won't eat it. I'll just eat clams because they don't get that same massive input of energy as when they're eating the herring, right? Which means that when they go to migrate, um, you know, and they're big birds, big heavy birds, that means they they're probably going to land at their breeding sites, arrive at their breeding sites with less weight than they would if they were able to take advantage of a, a abundant herring spawn. And we know that birds. Uh, uh, their breeding success is closely correlated with their weight um, um, at the onset of the breeding season, uh, especially females, you know, who are producing eggs that can be anywhere from 15 to 20 percent of their body weight. It's a tremendous energetic cost. Anybody who has chickens knows this. Um, when a chicken's molting or something, they're not that interested. I mean, they're okay. Their food is great. They like food. But when they're laying eggs every day or two, they just can't wait to eat in the morning. They're going crazy eating. So egg production is really tough on birds. And the scoters need to, um, to eat a lot of, um, they need the herring in order to successfully breed. Yeah. Uh, next question is, what happened to the Western grebes? Yes, thank you. So, so one of the things um, that I wanted to, you know, or, you know, could have made more clear I, is that um, every single species has a set of factors affecting that species that is unique from the other species. And one of the reasons why um, thinking about the conservation of marine birds is so complicated is that each species has its own set of factors. So the Western grebe uh, nests primarily in Alberta, Manitoba, um, Eastern British Columbia, and um, along with redneck grebes, fairly similar, uh, distribution. And um, these areas, uh, the lakes that they nest on have been highly impacted by both population growth and by the Santar oil uh, work up there. And, uh, but in particular, th so this is what, you know, each species has its own thing. They nest on floating, sort of semi-floating, their nests are sort of semi-floating tied to vegetation to the bottom of a lake right, in shallow areas. And motorboat wakes are just deadly for these birds. And so they're nesting on lakes that never had motorboats, right? And so, so they, they evolved to kind of assume fairly calm water, okay? And now you got motorboats cruising around because everybody up there working is having fun on the weekends and they're swamping the nest. The other thing is uh, predation from raccoons has become a a huge impact on grebe breeding. So, and then the third thing is, so so what? So one of the points here is, the birds who come here for the winter, they can be impacted on their breeding grounds 
and they can be impacted here, much in the way salmon can be impacted all the way through their life cycle. And so the way in which greaves have been impacted here primarily, a little less so now, is by uh, persistent pollutants in the environment. And there are studies of Western grebes that were, um, that had uh, pieces of tissue taken, <coughs> excuse me, from uh, Tacoma area in the 90s that showed that they had very high levels of contaminants um, and that they were about at the levels that can inhibit breeding, um, that just not allow successful breeding. So, so pollution is an issue for some parts of the Salish Sea, maybe not the whole Salish Sea, but some parts. Thank you. Um, another question we have is, do the invasive clams have something to do with the decline in herring, perhaps by affecting the benthic habitat in a way yeah. that alters eel gases? That's a great question. Um, I, you, you have to ask a different person, I'm afraid, because, uh, you know, I, I've never thought, I've never heard that proposed as a hypothesis, and, but, um, but I think it's definitely something worth thinking about. Um, the, I don't think the herring, uh, in drop in, um, the Cherry Point area has ever been definitively explained. Um, there is an issue with, you know, uh, herring collection, I mean, fishing, um, sometimes really pop, really highly populated species, kind of like the passenger pigeon, when they get, uh, to a certain level, they just crash, um, that kind of thing. Uh, of course, there's been habitat changes in the Cherry Point area. There's there's the big docks. There's been a loss of eelgrass. Um, there's definitely been some level of oil pollution. Um, it's not. I don't, there's never been a tanker that's broken up at Cherry Point, but there have been many many occasions where, uh, when people are connecting hoses and whatnot, um, amounts of oil have been um, you know gone into the water. Uh, you can find online a whole long, long list of of um, things like that, and um, so yeah, so I, so it's probably a, a set of factors that uh, have affected them. But one could be the ch a change in the substrate of for eelgrass. That certainly uh, is a reasonable, plausible hypothesis. Um, we had another comment on how herring don't just use um, eelgrass, they use all submerged. Aquatic. That's true. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's actually really important. And as I understand it, um, I, I went out on a boat where we were looking with a, I forget who it was. It's a friend of mine, but, um, and um, uh, who was working for the Fish and Wildlife. And, um, and there was a, quite a shift to algaes uh, for the herring spawn and the this is more up near between Birch Bay and Drayton Harbor, for instance. But yeah, that's good. That's a very good point. Thank you. And I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, I'm going to let people type in frantically if they have any remaining questions. Again, um, we'll send follow up stuff. And what I was thinking, I haven't done this before, but um, in the beginning, it was noted that people missed the side conversations. And so um, I'll stop the recording and I wanted to say a few closing remarks, but if anyone wants to hang out for maybe 15 minutes longer at most, um, I'll stop at the meeting at 1230. Um, I can put you into random breakout rooms and then you can, you know, choose to chat with people about takeaways from this, your next trip to the point, something cool, some cool bird you just saw recently or whatever it might be. Um, I hope that you can maybe have some of those um, those side chats. Oh, and um, so Rondi is going to post a link to the post survey in the chat. So you can feel free to take that now. You can also take it when we send out the post um, email that will have the recording to this along with other um, information, including um, the paper that John wrote um, and maybe some other stuff in there as well. Um, and I just wanted to say, we really appreciate having you all here. Um, I know that as John noted, um, and we were noting at the beginning of this, there were 
lots of distractions um, going on, especially this morning. So um, we appreciate you being here. Hopefully you learned a little bit more about the Cherry Point Aquatic Reserve. We encourage you um, to get involved with the Cherry Point Aquatic Reserve Citizen Stewardship Committee, and um, we'll give you more information on that. And um, thank you so much for joining us in this uh, different venue than we normally meet in, but um, hopefully it was still fun and engaging. And if you want to duck out now, that's totally fine. But if you want to stick around for the um, breakout rooms, I can uh, just hang on just a moment because I want to make sure that I don't put you all into breakout rooms and there's only one person in a breakout room all by themselves because everyone left all at once. <laughs> um, so thank you. And um, I'll give you just a moment to log off if you want. And thanks, everyone.